Take off the bib. Put on an apron. When you woke up and got dressed this morning, what did you put on? Pretty explanatory, is it? Because I'm looking at you right now. I'm not talking about your actual clothing. And there's a lot of, man, this is a good-looking crowd. I'm not talking about your actual clothing. I really don't care so much about what you're wearing today. I'm wanting to know this. Metaphorically speaking, when you woke up this morning, did you put on either a bib or an apron? What am I talking about? Well, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are, number one, bib people. And then number two, apron. Apron people. Now, let's learn a little bit about bib people. Bib people wake up every morning, and the first thing they do is they put on their bib, and they want to make sure they stay as clean as possible as everybody else serves them and provides for them. Bib people are about what they can get from others. Now, this is okay, obviously, for little babies. This is okay for toddlers because they're dependent upon their caregivers. But after a while, don't we expect our children to take off those bibs after they grow up and to put on an apron and start instead of receiving but giving to others, being a servant? And that's what it means to be an apron person. To be a servant. Apron people, these are the people who get up every morning, they put on that apron, and they get ready to go to work. They're rolling up their sleeves, they're ready to be servants, they're ready to share God's love with all people. They're about finding needs and meeting those needs. They're all about giving to others. Who can I give to today. That's the mindset of apron people. So again, I ask you as I ask myself, are we an apron people or are we bib people? Think about Jesus for just a moment. Which one was he? I think it goes without saying that Jesus was an apron person. He says clearly in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, he says, I came to not be served, but to serve others. So Jesus said, it's all about being a servant. And he is our example of a complete self, selfless giving and serving. Now again, what about you and me? Are we apron people or bib people? Now, we as human beings, we aren't all bad. You're not going to hear me up here talk about how bad we are, how depraved we are. Yes, we are sinfully made, but at the same time, Scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. God loves you. God created you. But the problem with us is that we sometimes tend to be a little selfish, don't we? We tend to be a little self-absorbed sometimes. It's all about me. I think of William Gladstone, who was a former pr British prime minister. He once said that selfishness is the greatest curse of the human race. Do you agree with that? The greatest curse is selfishness. Now think about it. From the day that we are born, from the moment that we are born, our world's revolve around us. You see, nobody has to teach a child how to be self-centered. You see up here the toddler's creed. Maybe you've heard of the toddler's creed before. But listen to this. If I like it, it's mine. If I can take it away from you, it's mine. If I had it a while ago, it's mine. If I say it's mine, it's mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I say I saw it first, 
it's mine. If you're having fun with it, it's mine. If you lay it down, it's mine. And of course, if it is broken, it's yours. That's the toddler's creed. And nobody has to teach a toddler to be self-serving, do they? That's just the way they are. But we do have to teach them to be servants of others. We are responsible for teaching our children how to take off the bib and how to put on the apron. But sometimes even we adults, we, have, we still have to learn that lesson. Maybe sometimes we still live by the toddler's creed. And that we, even we as grown-ups tend to be kind of self-consumed at times and expect others and expect our church to, to give to us all the time. But Jesus says there is a better way. There is a much better way. In Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, Jesus is approached by the mother of James and John, and she asks Jesus for a very special request. And she's speaking on behalf of her sons. And she goes to Jesus, and she wants her sons to hold a special place of honor in heaven sitting on the left and sitting on the right-hand side of Jesus. But Jesus responds with these unexpected words. Instead of saying, okay, sure, whatever you ask, Jesus says this, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Did you hear that? Did you hear what Jesus said in his response to that, I believe, very well-intentioned mother? He was saying that greatness in God's eyes is not about ruling over people. He says that greatness is in God's eyes, is about becoming more and more of a servant. That's how we become great. That's how we become a great congregation, is by serving others. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling the mother of James and John, that being great means being a servant. However, this was not popular in the tradition of the times. For the Greeks, and actually for many of the Jews, service was considered undignified. Very undignified, because they were believed that all people were born to rule over others. Not to serve, but to rule. So this was going against the whole mindset of the day. That instead of receiving and ruling over others, it was all about giving and being a servant of others. But Jesus, he just had a way of turning things around. He took the opposite view, saying it's only when you become a servant that you lay down your life for others. It's only then that you become great in the eyes of God. But what does it mean to be a servant? Take a look at the uh, a little word study that I have here for you this morning. The Greek word for servant is diakonos, where we get our in English translation of deacon. Because we may have some deacons here in the congregation this morning. But it literally means these three things. One definition is to serve lovingly. A deacon is to serve lovingly. Number two, it's to care for others. To take care of others. And number three, which I find really interesting, means to wait tables. Did you know that? That the word deacon actually means waiter and waitress. So we are called today to put on our apron and to be waiters and waitresses, to be servants of other people. And we learn about how this became very necessary in Scripture. Let me take you with me to Acts chapter 6. 
And it was that time in history that the church was exploding. It was growing like crazy, growing by thousands daily. And it was growing so dramatically that some of the Christian widows and some of the orphans were being overlooked in the daily distribution of the food. There were so many of them, they were being overlooked. Now, the apostles, they were busy teaching the word and proclaiming the word and spreading the gospel and spreading the faith. But here is this group of people in the church that are being overlooked. So something had to happen. And what happened was that the office of deacons was created. Servants, waiters and waitresses in the church so they could meet the needs within the congregation so the apostles could continue to spread the word and to spread the message of, of Jesus Christ. So that's what it means to be a servant, to be a waiter, to be a waitress. Now, let me highlight the fact of something here, that you don't have to be ordained to be a servant. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an elder. You don't even have to be an ordained deacon to be a servant. I believe that every single member is a minister. Every single one of us has a calling upon our lives. All of us daily are called to take off the bib, to put on an apron, and to meet those needs that are around us. Every single one of us, every single one of you is a gifted person. You have one or more spiritual gifts within you. You may not know what they are yet. But you're a very gifted person. God has blessed you with yet another day to go forth and to give to others. To be a servant. And it doesn't matter what it is. Find something to do. It can be putting shingles on a Habitat for Humanity house. I had one of my first official church duties this Friday when I was asked to join the congregation at a dedication of a new Habitat for Humanity House. It was very, it was very much an honor for me to be a, a part of that. I mean, and there's so many things that this church is involved with in terms of your mission. I mean, here's a few of the things right now. Focus on ministry, Brightest Horizons, Habitat for Humanity, Echo, God's Table, Three Cents a Meal, Mission Expeditions, and the list goes on and on and on about how you are involved in terms of the mission of this community. There are people in this congregation that every single morning you get up, you put on an apron, and you go to work. And I thank you for that. Let's continue to do that. Because we're all called to be servants of the Lord. Every single one of us. So today we're called to take off our bibs and to put on our aprons. Now, let me just say this quickly. Check, Chuck, if you go to the next one. This is a rule that plagues many churches and many corporations, believe it or not. Maybe you have heard of this. It's called the 80-20 rule, which means that 20% of the people do 80% of the work in just about any church. Are you a part of the 20% or are you a part of the 80%? The 20% of the people, these are the apron people. And, and, and part of why I'm here today is to empower us all, to encourage us all, to all become April, apron people and not to put all of the burden on that 20%. Because what happens to that 20% after a while? What happens to them? They burn out. They're like, okay, I'm done, I'm tired. And they may drop out of church altogether. You're gifted. Become a part, everybody taking part in the work of, of the church. Now, go ahead and, Chuck, go on to the next thing. But let me say this before I close. Thank you so much for your patience today and stay with me, okay? Because my closing story is going to be a little bit longer, okay? But I think you're going to like it. Are you with me? Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. Occasionally, I like to put on the bib. 
Does this look good on me? Occasionally, I like to put on the bid. Yesterday, I got, uh, I, I found a place that was open on Saturday. They could give me a haircut. And uh, I went to this lady, uh, and uh, I can't even remember where it was. I'm, all, I'm so lost around here. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. But I found this, this sweet Greek lady, and her name was Dula. And Dula, this hairstylist, was wearing an apron. And does anybody know what Dula means in Greek? It's another word. It means servant. So I go to this lady named Dula wearing an apron whose name means servant. And I'm telling her about my sermon today. <laughs> that I'm talking about bibs and, and aprons and, and everything. But at that moment, I was wearing, in a way, I was kind of wearing a bib. She was serving me, right? It wouldn't be appropriate for me to put on the apron and have her sit in the chair and me try to cut her hair, right? There are times when it's okay to let people wait on you. Sometimes there are people who are like, oh, no, I don't, you, you don't, that's okay, I'm all right. You don't, have to, you don't have to help me. You don't have to serve me. No, we do. Give people the opportunity to serve you, to share God's love with you. It's okay at times to put on the bib. But just remember to take it off and put that apron back on and be a servant to others. Does everybody get that? All right, now I'm going to close with this. I want to close with a story. It's a very popular fable known as The Last Wish of Horville Sash. The Last Wish of Horville Sash. And this is going to offer a great conclusion to our study today on servant leadership. So stay with me. Well, Horville Sash had a very humble job in the offices of the largest corporation in the world. And Horville, he worked as a mail clerk in the lowest reaches of this building. He was at the very, very bottom of the totem pole. But Horville did whatever he could to serve others down there with him, to help them with their lives, to help them with their jobs. But often, Horville, he wondered. He wondered what went on the floor just above him. But he didn't dwell on it too long. He didn't go back to work and helping and serving those around him. Well, then came a day when Horville found a little bug that was scurrying across the floor. Just scurrying across the floor. And Horville figured that even, and he noticed that this bug was there. And then he raised his foot to flatten this bug. When all of a sudden, the bug spoke. And the bug said, please don't kill me. And Horvel just looked back like, oh my goodness, a talking bug. And then the little bug said, if you let me live, I'll give you three wishes. Well, Horvel figured that even if he didn't get the wishes, a talking bug would make him millions of dollars. So he let the bug live. And the bug asked him what he wanted for his first wish. And Horville said, I want to be promoted to the second floor. The very next day, Horville showed up to work. And guess what? His wish had come true. Here he was, promoted to the second floor. And then Horville, he walked that day into the second floor like a conquering general. And he heard footsteps above him, even then. And he said to the bug, my second wish is to be promoted floor by floor until I reach the very top of this building, of this company, until I am charged of the whole thing. And the bug just simply said, done. And so 
Floor by floor, Horville, he moved his way up through the ranks from the 10th floor, the 20th floor, the 50th floor, the 90th floor, and then finally Horville made it to the very, very top. He was as high as he could possibly go. Chairman of the board, CEO, corner office, he had it made. And so here was Horville, he was sitting in his office, and then one day he heard footsteps above him even then. And he looked out his door and he saw a sign that said, stairs. So he took those stairs up to the rooftop. And there he found one of his clerks that he used to work with down in the very first floor. And he found his clerk and he was near the edge of the building and he had his eyes closed. And Horval said, well, what are you doing? And the clerk said, I'm praying. And then Horville said, to whom? And then the boy said, pointing up toward heaven, he says, I'm praying to God. Panic at that moment, it gripped Horville. There was a floor even above his he couldn't see it. All he saw was clouds. He couldn't hear the shuffling of feet above him. He says, do you mean there is authority over me? So what did Horville do? Do you remember the little bug? He summoned the little bug, and it was time for his third and his final wish. And this is what he wished. He said, make me God. Make me the highest. Put me in the kind of a position only God would hold if he were here on earth right now. Do you see where I'm going with this? Well, that very next morning, Horville woke up and he found himself down in that basement sorting the mail and doing what he could do to help others be the best that they could possibly be. And that's the day that Horville Sash learned what Jesus taught. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. My friends, today and every day, as we begin our new journey together, and me and my family, we're so excited to be with you. We're called to take off the bib, put on the apron. And God's people said, 